victory. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another edition of the Victory Life Legacy Podcast. I'm your host, Dwight Vic, owner and founder of Victory Life, but also I'm with my brother, um, Young D, Danny Noakes. What's good with you, Danny? It's been a long time, man. How you doing? <laughs> It has been a long time, man. It's always great to catch up with you. And although it's been several months since we've done one of these, uh, I don't have a whole lot to report to you, actually. Not a whole lot has changed, my man. Everything's still going well, though, and, and hope it is in your world, too. I know you've been busy following Isaiah around for the last several months on, on another awesome state championship run that uh, did not end how we had all hoped that it would. Yeah, man. I think all that trash talk I did about Northern Virginia and Fairfax County came back and it caught up with me when I was in college. I never had an issue, but when as I was in my twenties, you know, we used to always talk about the seven five seven and but I'm a I'm a Virginian, man. And Isaiah, yes, for those wondering, I've been super busy with, with Zay, Isaiah's uh college situation that we're dealing with now. Uh, you know, and then Basketball, high school basketball, so different from when you and I played. It's a year-round thing, man. Um, in the last two years, primarily, he's been on varsity all four, but the last two years have been crazy with his, uh, you know, season from playing at the Matha and Capitol Hoops and all that stuff, and then uh, dealing with, you know, traveling to Woodside, the Newport News, and Virginia Beach to play. Um, it's been a wild ride, but Isaiah's had a great experience. I'm proud of him. Um, ended up being all state. I remember mentioning all Matt. So it's so funny we're talking about basketball because we're going to be joined here in about 20, 21 minutes by two football coaches with Virginia Tech. But Daniel, let's touch on as literally as we were getting over the technical difficulties between you and I, because it's been so long, our, our laptops and headsets are like, what who are you guys? <laughs> um I just saw Don V's tweet, and I'm going to jump. We're going to talk a little bit about Kenny Brooks, but I just saw, and you may know this, it's five players in the portal right now from men's basketball. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Don V757, five guys in the portal? Yeah, and the last time I checked, Dwight, the big three were Lynn Kidd, Sean Padula, and MJ Collins. So, the other two, I'm not sure if I had seen that there were an additional couple of Hokies that had entered the transfer portal, which seems like most players want to do these days because it's just the Wild West when it comes to transferring schools at this point. But that's not a good look um, following a second consecutive underachieving season by Mike Young and, and his men's basketball program. That's definitely concerning. I'm interested to see how he addresses that this offseason. Well... Our guy, Matei, uh, from 247 Sports, I'm looking at Twitter right now, uh, another Virginia Tech Hokies 2024-2025 roster update. This is men's basketball. Six players has entered the transfer portal. Virginia Tech currently has seven scholarship spots available for next year. Team will be entirely different as things stand. So I'm about to tweet, look, Right now, with live while we record this, I'm about to tweet and say, I know a kid that grew up a Hokie that's 6'7", might be 6'8 now, that would love uh, to be a Hokie. <laughs> I mean, why listen, not? I mean, listen. I got, what? hey, I've been saying, I've been saying this as, I've been saying this since before Isaiah's senior season started, but he has the type of build, the type of character, and he's just the type of athlete I think that the Virginia tech men's basketball program right now needs, you know, I feel like in a lot of games this year, especially when they got into the ACC, they have very few guys on, on what was last year's roster because it's going to be completely flipped when we kick, when we tip things off here in a few months, but th there was only maybe Padula could create his own shot. Right. And mm -hmm. that, that is, there's a, there's a lot of different reasons for that, but, they they need they need more guys that can can you know give offenses fits and and that are tough to guard and that can play defense as well. I know Isaiah is a great defender, so I, I it's yeah, funny because as I've been as I've been watching as I've been watching you guys go through the state tournament here for the last several months, I've been thinking, man, I hope Virginia Tech is giving him a call because he's the he's the exact type of guy we need right now, and he's got the Vic name carries the legacy. Listen, sometimes. Life gives you a, a the answer right in front of you. Like, it's so funny because <laughs> here's the thing. I'm going to say this, and, and I want to talk. I want to get your thoughts on Kenny uh, Brooks, too, man, because Virginia Tech, 
other than football right now and wrestling, shout out to men's wrestling, national championship. And what's my guy's name? Oh, gosh, I'm going to have my notes in front of me. But the wrestling coach has been on my pod. Great guy. But other than wrestling and baseball and football right now, it's a lot of question marks. But real, real quick, back to my son. And I'm not even on some LeVar. I'm not even on some LeVar Ball-ish right now. I'm just telling you right now. Um, the thing about it is, is that when I look at he's played against some of the top players in the DMV. And one thing I didn't know until I moved to Northern Virginia, being a 757 guy, Jay Wright said this before he retired. The DMV, Northern Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. is the mecca, is the epicenter for talent when it comes to high school basketball. You got the WCAC, okay. which is the toughest conference, mm -hmm. high school conference in the nation. It ain't even no debate, so debate with your mama. Number two, <laughs> you got <laughs> – you got so many private schools and public schools. You got Hayfield, South Lakes. You got Patriot now, who's established himself, you know, only 12 years old, is one of the best teams up here. They played – this year they played South Lakes, who won Division Six over them. They played Hampton High with my best – one of my best friend coaches, who won Division Four, And they played uh, Woodside, which repeated as champions, five, Division Five. But if you take it a step mm -hmm. further, if you look at, like, just to kind of humble brag real quick, my son, his junior year, played on NBC regional coverage, played against Cam Ward, who is the number one player in the DMV for 2025. Gave him 21 and 10 and four, four steals, four assists, two steals. Um, went to overtime. He got an MVP of the game. Uh, he played this year against Cam, um, not Cam, but uh, Nader Mint and other guys against South Lakes, Jordan Scott, who Virginia Tech was there to see in December. The little short mm. coach, the recruiter, came to see Jordan Scott because Jordan Scott has 20-plus Power 5 offers. Patriot won. You probably saw the video. Isaiah crossed up. Everybody dunked on everybody. Had 17-7-7. Yep. Seven and seven. But you know what? It doesn't matter because I'm a dad, and I want him to go where he's wanted. People are asking me right mm. now, what's he going to do? Right now, he's going to play AAU with New World, and then he's probably going to prep if we don't get the best offer at Fork Union. Um, but again, okay. there's a lot of people in his DMs and inbox. That's not a commitment. That's just what we're looking at. He's only 17, Danny. He turns 18 yeah. um, in May. And with the portal now and everybody being older, you got guys 24, 23 years old playing an NCAA tournament. When I was 24, I was living in Fair Oaks. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was living in Fairfax County. I just got cut from the Ravens. But um, <laughs> hey, look, D, I want to get your thoughts, man. Should we be mad or should we be cool on Kenny Brooks leaving for Kentucky, the great women's basketball oh. coach? I mean, it, it's it's a good question. I like the way you phrased it too. But come on, we got to be cool about it, right? We got to be cool. You know, it it's I I get that folks are frustrated right now because of what the success that he had had in the last couple of years brought Tech to a Final Four. You, you may, if Kenny Brooks had stayed, be able to keep Georgia Amor around for another season. And then the opportunity to develop Claire Strack, who was had already been taken under the wing of Liz Kitley. Like, that would have been really fun to watch. And and obviously, he is such a nice guy. And, and that's coming from people that have never actually met him. I, I was actually fortunate, Dwight, to be at his introductory press conference very many eight years ago, it was. Um, and I actually got to ask him a question, which was pretty cool. He was super nice about it. Um, but when, when an opportunity like this comes up to obviously take another step financially forward, right? That's, that's one part of it. But also to go to the best conference in the sport, in women's basketball, the best conference is the SEC. And and to take on a, a brand new challenge with a, a story basketball program are all things that would entice any normal person to at least consider going somewhere else. So, of course, I don't fault him at all. It's very sad. Don't get me wrong. It's very sad because of everything that he had accomplished with the players that are now leaving it. It really kind of it, it really feels like the end of of the Buzz Williams era in a lot of ways, although Kenny Brooks had significantly more success than Buzz did at, at Virginia sure Tech. Uh, and they were both in, they were both at the bottom of the conference when both of those coaches took over. I'm old, I'm old enough to remember the Dennis Wolf days when he was the head coach of, of the women's basketball team. And I used to go and set up his radio show every single week. And, <laughs> and he was, um, 
you know, he was not always in the best mood and <laughs> it's hard to blame him for that. But <laughs> yeah, I, I get why people are upset about it. But at the same time, you know, you tip your cap in these sort of situations, you show class and that's what he deserves. He he laid it all on the line for for the maroon and orange every time he went out for, to practice to coach those girls every time they laced them up to go play games. He, he could not have been a better ambassador for Virginia tech. And, and for that, he deserves all of our support. And now I guess the question becomes, who do you replace him with? Because you just mm. saw Sean Poppy, former member of Kenny Brooks's staff, just took the job to go from Chattanooga to Clemson. So he's yeah. going to be in the conference now and the Hokies are going to have to compete against him. So Whip Babcock once again has his work cut out for him, but yeah, we, Kenny Brooks deserves a lot of credit and all love, no hate for sure. Absolutely, man. I get Tech fans are passionate, and I get that they definitely want, um, they love and want the team to win. The Final Four last year was legendary, and they they had a chance. I mean, they were close. I mean, and I feel like that's always been the story of Tech sports. We're close. We're right there. Yeah. And then, you know, Keekly, three-time ACC Player of the Year, right, gets hurt against UVA. Ugh. Horrible. You know what I'm saying? And I met her. Yeah. At the spring game, took some pictures with her. We were up in there at NIL Tech Triumph. Yeah, it's on Twitter. Tech Triumph. We were up in the suite. Humble. Is uh is she taller than you? <laughs> uh dude. I She's think pretty we tall. Like, I think she might have been like here. Or we were looking. I mean, I'll I'll find yeah. the picture, but it's on Twitter. It got a bunch of retweets because you know she's a legend. I mean, they, there was talk about her being on the Mount Rushmore. And again, look, let me say yeah. this real quick, man. It is so hard to do that. The Mount Rushmore, we need a, we need a better, uh, what's the word? We need a better template. Uh, Mount Rushmore oh, is four yeah. people. You cannot limit right. that to four tech people. Um, you know, yeah. but look, man, I think in the times like this, we salute the players. It's just a different time, Danny. I, I'm I'm older than you. Yeah. And it's just, I was, I, I'm watching the tournament and I'm seeing every time I watch a game, Oh, transfer from here, transfer from here. And I'm like, it's just, you know, it's a business more than ever. Um, I do want to say this real quick before we bring the coaches on. Um, I want to circle back to, um, we didn't touch on everything, but we're back in the swing of things, not at my son. So we're going to be, for those watching and subscribing to us, listening on Spotify, make sure you subscribe on our YouTube channel as well. But we're going to be doing more of these now, now that we're getting closer to the spring game. And also before we know it, we'll be talking about the ACC football schedule. But one thing about Mike Young that I find interesting, and it just shows you the difference in coaches, because when Fuente experienced this, it was hate. It wasn't love hate. It was hate. He got a lot of blame, a lot of smoke, where Mike Young, because he's got credibility, he won that ACC tournament championship a few years ago, and Tech basketball is still very credible. He lost, according to uh, what I just read on Twitter from 247 Sports, he's lost six players to the portal. Um the thing about it is, though, if that was Fuente before Pride went over there, we'd be talking about that the entire show. So I'm not about to get on here, and I'm not afraid of calling anybody out, including myself, but do you mm -hmm. think, real quick before we bring Pearson and those guys on, do you think that this is a, I'm leaving because, you know, I want to go somewhere else because I had a great career and I'm going to take a look at some other stuff, or is this a situation where, there's some concern. Is it the style of play? Because that is a lot of players, even though I would love to yeah. get one of them scholarships. <laughs> a lot of players, though, right? Yeah. No, and, it, and, and that's where, yeah, that's that's where I'm concerned, dude. Like, it's it's a big number. It's six guys in the transfer portal at one time is a big number, you know? So yeah. that leads that that leads me to believe also, though, that there's probably several different reasons for that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. When you look at guys like Tyrese Radford that have also been here and left, obviously he's now at Texas A&M playing for Buzz, and he had a previous relationship with Buzz, so you you have that you have to mention that for for full context in that exact situation. But there has been a lot of talent that's left the Virginia Tech men's basketball program over the last two to three years, and that's impossible to ignore. Also impossible to ignore is back to back underachieving seasons. I mean, this year they they just didn't even show up when they played on the road. They were so bad whenever they would go away from Castle that it sunk any chance they had of being in the NCAA tournament. They beat Clemson. They beat Iowa State. We're talking about teams that are still alive in the NCAA tournament right now. 
mm-hmm. not to mention they 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 kept they kept themselves in the game against Duke. Obviously, Duke I think ended up winning by ten early yeah. on in the season that yep. year. But you know it, it's 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 troubling, and it's not a good trend. So Coach Young needs to to hit that recruiting trail hard, hit the transfer portal hard, see who he can bring in to be a part of of the culture that they've established now that he's going to be going into his sixth season. That's the other part, right? Because he's going into season six now, and it's been three out of the five years he's been here so far. He has missed the NCAA tournament. So, you know how how hey, how long does the, how long does that remain acceptable? I don't know. That's a great question because. If you take a step back, Kyler Perry at Kentucky, other than that 2012 championship, the last eight years, seven years, they have lost early and underachieved with mm-hmm. future lottery and draft picks. You look at UVA, Tony Bennett, other than that great year when the guy that had the Cisco dyed hair from Drew Hill hit that crazy <laughs> shot against Purdue. If he doesn't hit that shot, they don't win after the previous year. They lost against a 16 seed, which for the record, I know we're both Hokies, but I am a huge Tony Bennett fan, always have, always will be, because I think he does a lot for coaching, and he's great for the game. But we're talking Mm -hmm. results. UVA, a lot of people are getting on him. And you look at um, Hubert Davis, a Fairfax guy, Northern Virginia. Shout out to Hubert Davis, Mm coaching Carolina. First time since the Jordan era, Kenny Smith, they brought everybody back last year. And um, they were the unanimous number one on the cover of Sports Illustrated and literally wet the bed, didn't make the tournament, got swept by their rival Duke, and they were calling for his head. And and let's be honest, the year before when they went to the Final Four and lost to Kansas in the championship, they had to win their last five out of six games or whatever, make a run to make the tournament that year. I say all this Mm -hmm. to say this, Danny, is that I think – I'm not saying fans have to be patient or we have to lower or temper expectations. I'm saying like yeah. the fluidness in that, like if that's a word, the fl- fluidity, whatever, help me out. The word fluidity. I'm looking for. There you go. Yeah. Okay. I got it right. Okay. Virginia Tech education. You got it. Yeah. You got it. I got it. <laughs> the fluidity is done. That, 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 oh, every year, tw- it, 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 it's hard. So you, what I would do is I would get guys that fit my system that I can develop and maybe, Keep that core because let's say just as we segue into the football segment of the show, Brent Pryor, for some reason, is doing it. He's one of the few schools, Virginia Tech, that in the bowl game, post-game season, 21 of their 22 starters stayed and played in the bowl game. He's retained all his yeah. coaches. The portal kids that are hitting the portal should hit the portal, and all the right players are staying. I don't know, man, but he kind of he's he's figuring something out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting, man, because they the the maybe when Brent Pry was hired, the two programs were in very opposite situations. I think the men's basketball team had just come off the ACC tournament championship, and Coach Pry came in and and the first season they were it was the worst Virginia Tech football season that we've seen thirty thirty five years. But now. Yes. Just just, you know, just a couple of years later, he's he's figured it out, you know, and and this is what we talked about a lot throughout this past football season was, you know, when when they started out two and four. The players could have mailed it in, the coaches could have mailed it in and just assumed, ah, well, we you know, this season got away from us. We had some unlucky things with the Purdue game, the ridiculous, you know, uh, rain delay that, that screwed everything up for everybody. But they didn't do that. They didn't sulk. They didn't hang their heads. They got back into it and they beat every team that they were supposed to beat in, in the last half of the season. Their only couple of losses were the teams that you wouldn't have expected them to beat anyway. So mm-hmm. that combined with the fact that you've got when when you talk about the bowl game and guys wanting to participate in that, that that to me spells buy in. And in addition to not giving up on the season when you start out real slow with a losing record like two and four. That to me says mm-hmm. they're they're picking up what Coach Pry is putting down, and and that's yeah. very encouraging to see. I like the improvements that they're making to to you know all of the the off season stuff that they've got going on nil. They're clearly investing in it, so it's 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 only going to get more fun from here, buddy. I, I I'm I'm excited to see what Coach Pry and his staff bring to this 2024 season because man, it's uh, I I know Hokie fans have been itching to see to see these guys back in contention for an ACC championship. 
Yeah, well, and look, we got guys joining us that's hopefully going to get us to the ACC championship, man. Um, our longtime friend, Danny, you and Pearson used to do the uh, pregame show together after me and Kyle Bailey moved on. I played with Pearson Prelo. So we are joined now. I don't know what Coach DJ is doing. Is he, on a, he might be on a call with a recruit. Uh, <laughs> oh, we got he's got him. his wife. He's we him got up. him. Got, Some, does somebody have to set you up, up, DJ? <laughs> is he good? You mute it, Coach. She don't got a hot. We, we're we, gonna get we're not even away. alive. We're good. Um, no, but it, it, it's it's uh, great to have you on, Pearson. Uh Ladies and gentlemen, for those that are, will be listening on Spotify, we're joined now by two great Virginia Tech coaches. We have Pearson Prelo, my former teammate, my brother, uh, one of the fastest men out of South Carolina, had a 44-inch vertical, which I don't know if it's a school record still. <laughs> Coach DJ, the man with the best tweets and the best quotes, also, uh, you know, one of the guys that he's also known as Coach Cheetah. So um, Great style. Don't forget great, great style. style. Come on, man. Uh, had those <laughs> wings. Uh, Coach DJ, can you hear us? Okay. He's getting set up, man. So, Pearson, um, we were yes, just sir. talking uh, about, you know, Danny and I were just talking about the, the game that is now, man. And um, we're talking about Coach Kenny Brown, who I'm a big fan of, took the job at Kentucky with the women's basketball team, really set the standard with women's basketball at Tech since the days we had Lisa Witherspoon and Lisa Leftwich and – J.C. Price's wife, I mean, um, you know, we haven't seen these kind of teams since Lisa and all them played. And then you have, um, you know, now I just went on Twitter and I was telling Danny, you had um, now six guys from the basketball team uh, that are on the portal now, um, which is pretty remarkable in the fact that we're able to see all these changes, but yet your, your, your coach, our coach as well, Brent Pry has been able to keep everybody for the bowl game. You know, he was able to retain 20 out of 20, 21 out of 22 starters. And all of y'all are back for another season in, in regards to coaches, man. So what is what has it been like? Well, that's, you know, that's just a testament of, uh, you know, not a knock to the, what's going on in our basketball program, and more of a testament of what Coach Pry has built, not only with the staff, but with uh, the team and the standard that we're setting and how guys are excited about the opportunity that we have. It's that, that culture, uh, Dwight, that we had, you know, almost 30 years ago, I think it, it's back. You know, Coach Pryor was, was there when this thing was getting started back in 95, and he understands what belongs in Blacksburg, and he understands what it takes to be uh, successful in Blacksburg. And that's why he brought guys like Coach Jones and some of these other coaches in that are, that are 100% invested and, and, and excited to return. And that's why we're recruiting the kind of players that we are. And we know we have to continually recruit those guys every year to keep those guys as a part of our program. But also, I think those guys recognize, you know, the opportunities that we have, especially this next year going forward. No doubt. Um, Coach, Coach, Coach DJ, can you hear us? Yes, man, I got you. Can you guys hear me? Okay, good, good. Okay, guy. I'm okay, clear. good. Yeah, I, we can hear you well, man. I gave you a great introduction, man. I talked about how you had the best <laughs> quotes on Twitter and – you know, you, a.k.a. Coach Cheetah and how you, you know, you just be dropping dimes on um, Twitter, man. Just great knowledge, man. Full of energy. You and Pearson. First of all, I know you must be a great guy and a great coach because I've known Pearson since I was, uh, what, 19 years old? And I'm in my 40s now. Pearson doesn't do all these podcasts and taking selfies on the recruiting trail. So you must be a very special person to get him to come out because he just, Pearson showed up play football. And that was it. He got interceptions and made tackles. So, Coach DJ, thanks for joining Danny and I on the Victory Life Legacy Podcast, man. Um, how how you been, man? Man, I've been good, man. I appreciate you guys having me on, man. It's always a pleasure. And, uh, you know, Pierce was one of them guys. Uh, I got there with him, and he wasn't much into the social media thing or whatever, but I guess it's infectious. And uh, yeah, we probably well, got to be two peas you, in a pod to make the thing go the way we want it to go. But it, he's on board now. So I put yeah. the camera in his face most of the time and don't give him a choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, while you while you and your wife were getting set up, man, and, and making sure everything was straight, one thing, I, and I'll ask you this, and I'll let Danny pose some questions to you both, but um, the one thing I was telling uh, Pearson when he jumped on was that 
um, what I feel like is going on in Blacksburg with the football program. I mean, obviously the wrestling coach, he's been on our show. That's my guy. They just had a national champion. Shout out to the wrestling program. The women's basketball came off another great season, but unfortunately, and fortunately, because we're happy for Coach Kenny Brooks, he's doing what's best for him, and he left a great legacy. Other programs, not just at Tech, are going through turnover, portal. You're, you you, and the football program, Coach, you guys have been able not only to get players coming in, and you just got a four-star linebacker recruit from up here near me out of Culpeper to commit great film, great linebacker. You guys retained 21 the 22 starters for the um, military bowl. I was there. So I'm still drying off in Annapolis. Um, <laughs> coach Marv, shout out to coach Marv. He just, I believe he got an extension, right? You know what I'm saying? So can the brother get a dollar cash app DVIC 757? <laughs> so the fact of the matter is there's a lot of positive vibes and energy going on in Blacksburg, man. And I was telling Danny before you both logged on, seems like coach Prodge figured it out, but it's not just him. I've always said it's the staff, man. How is the energy around it? How have you guys been able to get the players, as Danny said, to buy in? What's been not so much your secret, but what are you guys doing in Blacksburg to do that? Well, I think the biggest thing is, you know, it starts at the top. You know, I think uh, just Coach Pry, his personality, um, his personal touch with the guys, and those are things that goes on, you know, 365 days a year. Um, you know, as a head coach, a lot of times those guys are untouchable. Those guys don't necessarily have relationships with players. And with everything that's going on in the landscape of college football right now, it's very important for the head coach and all of the assistants to have personal relationships with the young men um, that they play on the team. You know, oftentimes the most the head coach talks to a player, unless he's a troublemaker, is doing the recruiting process. Mm -hmm. But I think Coach Pride does a really good job of making sure that he lets the players know that he care about them. Um, his coaching style demonstrates that. And he hired a staff that reflect um, his personality, his beliefs, and uh, everything that he understands that it takes to win. So, you know, um, I think it's a family. You know, it's not something that you can fake. It's not something that you can try to pretend. Um, if you look at the retention of the staff, I mean, that should tell you in itself. You know, uh, anytime a coach can keep all 10 assistants uh, on board with him, um, that's unheard of in um, today's landscape of college football. Um, and not only did he keep all 10 of us assistants intact, we kept the vast majority of our football in team intact as well. And I think that's just because of the family atmosphere that we have at VTech right now. No doubt. Yeah. So I, I think this next question I could I could pose to both of you guys, Pearson and, and Coach DJ. Pearson, I'll, I'll start with you and then and, and Coach Cheetah, you can get in on this one if you want as well. But I'm kind of curious as to how you all sort of approach recruiting as as a staff in in today's day and age not not to give away any trade secrets or anything like that right but just <laughs> you've got them you've got to monitor the portal you you've you've got so many different things that kids want to hear about or are interested in these days with with regards to what they'll get in addition to to a chance to play football and and the academics that come with whatever school that you're going to and then from from your guys' standpoint you're doing a lot of traveling be it via uh, automobile or on the plane like I, I always see the pictures of you guys going somewhere going yeah. to talk to somebody going to talk to some coaches and stuff like that so i'm curious as to how you guys approach that and and how it's changing like year over year, because it seems like it's even a lot different today than it was maybe two or three years ago. Well, you know, uh, we're obviously recruiting has changed and the landscape of it has changed with a ton of different variables. You mentioned uh, the portal and, 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 and you mentioned the, the NIL and all of those things, all those things do have its place in recruiting now, but we are going to keep recruiting as authentic as possible. And what I mean by that is we're still going to, develop our team through the high school ranks. We are going to be active in the portal because it's necessary in today's landscape, but our team is, the core of our team is going to be developed through the high school ranks. And Coach Cheetah, he'll tell you, we, we always say, we don't, we're not a group that's going to song and dance and, and, and entertain recruits in a way, other than a way that, hey, we're going to recruit the best players to be a part of this university that want to be a part of this university. And, and, and that's how we were built. We want guys that want to be Hokies. And, and, and that fit our program, the culture that we want to build to become the team we want to build. We're going to build it through guys that want to be us. And we're going to recruit the best. 
You know, we're going to start in Virginia because that's the core of our program, but we're going to go to the surrounding area and recruit the best. But we're only going to take the guys that belong here in Blacksburg. And and we, we with all those other variables, the portal and the NIL and all those things that have their place, we're going to go, go back to the nucleus. And that's Blacksburg is a place that we call home, and we want to get guys that want to call it home as well. No doubt. You know, to piggyback on that, um, you know, uh, first and foremost, you know, Virginia is where it starts with us um, from recruiting. You know, when Coach Pry hired me, uh, right when he got hired, he said, that's what we're going to harp on. You know, we're going to recruit the state of Virginia. We're going to make it a priority. And um, we're going to get young men that are recognized as good players uh, in the state of Virginia on our roster because they will help us to recruit other players from the state of Virginia. But I think the other philosophy is um, – we recruit what's called the footprint. And the footprint for us is basically a five to six hour radius. And um, that's pretty much we, what we try to stick within. And um, a lot of things are happening in college football, you know, that a lot of people outside of our world don't understand. You know, the amount of days that us as assistant coaches uh, can be on the road has been cut drastically. Yeah. You know, the head coach can only get out on the road to recruit. Um, basically a few weeks in December and a few weeks in January. So you're making very tough decisions. But I think one of the things that people really got to take into context now is uh, with the world of NIL um, and the transfer portal, the further away you go from home, the more likely a lot of players are to try to possibly at some point in time go back home if things aren't going well. Um, you look at a lot of successful programs right now that have young men that left and went and played seven, eight, nine, ten hours away from home. And, you know, in the world of NIL, um, you're popular and your market is valuable the closer you are to home. So a lot of these young men are seeing what some of their teammates are getting because they're local products, so to speak, and those things aren't happening for them. And um, it's easier for them to go back where their name, image, likeness has a little bit more power. And a lot of those things are happening and we don't have control of that. Um, in the world. It's just the business aspect of it. So the other thing is, you know, uh, with the transfer portal, you need to know the character of the young men um, that you're recruiting. Uh, you need to know their parents. You need to know their priorities and all of those things. And the closer you recruit to home during the process, the more often you can get to prospects and the more often those families can get to you. And those two extra visits to campus, so those two extra visits to a school, that makes all the difference in the world. Because, you know, we have a very short amount of time that we can deal with these guys anyway. And, you know, if you're recruiting a bunch of guys spread out a long way from home, less of that that you can do. So you don't get a chance to find out that there's some handler that's going to have his hand out at some point soon. <laughs> um, that's not a reflection of the kid nor his parents uh, in that case. So the closer you recruit to home, the more you get to know about players and the more they feel calling a place like Virginia Tech home. You know, uh, nothing has changed in college football, man. There's nothing like knowing that you've got a car full of people pulling up to see you play on Saturday. Yes. I know for a fact, man. I, I'm from South Carolina, and I went to school at Ole Miss, and it, it wasn't too often I had a car full of people pulling up for me. So I got an appreciation for this. Man, let me tell you something, man. I don't know if I told you this, uh, Coach DJ, man, but, man, South Carolina, man, that's like my second spot, man. Everybody I play with at Tech, man. My style killer, we had Jamel Smith on on the uh, Big 757 show with me and Mike. Pearson, of course. Then you got my man Jay Haygood, Tyrone Drakeford. Y'all South Carolina men, y'all South Carolina boys were fun to hang with, man. I'm telling you. Like, hey, I don't know where it is, man. And I don't know how y'all live down there because that heat is different. I thought that 757 heat was different. We played at, we played at Clemson, me and Pearson's senior year, my red shirt senior year, his senior year. And we played at Clemson at noon, and I felt like the sun was behind the bench. It was so <laughs> hot. I'm so glad we won 37 nothing because I was trying to get out that game. I was – look, I was about to – hey, I ain't going to say what I was going to do, but I was just ready to get done. But, you know, Coach, I, I see you a lot in the 757. I know you've been coaching prior to coming to Tech, man. Um, Have you got it – because you you are a food connoisseur. You uh, – one thing about you, you love family and you love food and you love people. And I've seen your tweets about restaurants and bars in Blacksburg and Christiansburg, different places. You always look for recommendations. In the 757, have you been told about Chicka C? No, I hadn't heard that one, man. Nobody, oh. nobody, put, nobody put me on that one yet. Okay. 
There's one in Hampton. I believe there might be one in Newport News, but the one in Hampton looks like you can't go in there. It's a it's a it's a hood spot. But if you I'm go okay in there, nobody gonna bother you. But it's no, you'll be fine. It but it's it's the, the chicken is crazy. They got fried gizzards. It's just one of them spots in Hampton. It's not that far from Hampton High because I grew up on Shell Road, but definitely check out the wings, but you gotta eat it in the car. Ain't no place to sit down inside. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm good with that. Well, hey, make sure you send me the information of that. And uh, matter of fact, Pearson and I both will be over there in a couple of weeks together. Yep. Yeah. We're going yeah. by. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, for real. It's, it, you know, again, I know you guys, we all older. We got to eat healthy. But if you want to have a cheat day, check a seat. But uh, Pearson, I'm going to ask you this. Um, and, and then uh, Coach DJ, I want your thoughts on this, man. Pearson, you 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 both coaches mentioned the NIL and it's it's got – it's you hear the pros and cons. I'm not gonna get into the metrics of it and you know, is it good or bad? This is more so a fun question. Do you wish Pearson you had the NIL when we played? Do you wish that absolutely. existed? <laughs> Why? Why Come on, right? Of course. Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, if if I would be lying and I would be definitely speaking from the mind of a coach and somebody on the other side of the table if I told you no. I mean, obviously you understand that this it is a big business and we you remember Dwight, man. We we had nothing. We had the scholarship, and, and we were just hoping that check would last the, the whole semester until we got our next one to pay our bills, and that was about it. We didn't have the cost of attendance and some of the other things these guys are afforded. And uh, you know, we, you know, everybody want to be compensated for what they do. And you know, obviously, we're in a space now where we're still unfamiliar with something that has just broken open, and 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 the regulations are all over the place. But we all. I mean, anybody that's played this game, if they told you they did not wish that NIL was in the space when they played, would just be yelling out all kind of foolishness. You know better than that. We all wish oh, it I was know. there. But, you know, we understand, you know, the, the complications and, and and all the ramifications and the ups and the downs of what it has brought to the game. And obviously, it's, it's not all good and it's not all bad. But if, I, if wishing it, that it was here when I played, absolutely. You know, <laughs> absolutely. but, 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 uh, Pearson, uh, but before I get we'll hear uh, Coach Cheetah's answer, man, when you talk about players, and I, I only you two can answer this, but do you isn't there a misconception? Because you know I, I stay running my mouth on Twitter and I do other platforms, other pods. I feel like I I feel like I'm explaining to to, to casual fans that there's a misconception that players are walking in like you know that dude in blue chips with asking for the bag, and I mean yeah, I mean. Players want to know, but is is it is it is it the wild wild west out here? Well, we try to stay out of it as much as we can. You I know, know we got so tech triumph. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I yeah. So uh, you know, yeah. as far as the numbers, you know, we only you know hear stuff. But I can't. I, I'd be wrong if I told you I know everything. I can't even tell you what the players on our team make because we try to stay out of it as much as we can, just to keep it authentic. And Coach DJ yep. Tate is saying we 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 just say we know that. We have some guys that are working with Triumph, but our job is to make sure that our, our, our players are, are the best they can be on the field and, you know, make sure they're available to play. And, and we, I try to – me, myself, I don't want to know. I tell my guys, don't tell me because I don't want you to think that I'm going to coach you any differently based on what's going on behind those closed doors. That's not a part of uh, my my meeting room, and I know Coach Cheeto probably second that. What about you, Coach? Man, what I would say is um, the 49-year-old me says, yes, I wish that we had NIL when I was in school because I now know how to manage money. I now yeah. understand the stock market. I now understand retirement and mm -hmm. all the things that you need to know as a mature adult. But the 18, 19, 20, and 21-year-old me would probably not be sitting in front of you right now if I had NIL <laughs> when I was in college. <laughs> because I just sit back and think, you know, um, I went to college back during the era of the uh, athletic dorm when all of us were in there mm. together, man. Yeah. We didn't have a whole lot, but we made a whole lot happen, you know. Yes. And we didn't realize we didn't have any money, man, because when Thursday <laughs> rolled around, Friday rolled around, Saturday rolled around, everybody had a good time. And you didn't have a lot of guys complaining about I'm broke. I mean, college, there's no such thing as broke because everybody broke. Yes, <laughs> so, that's right. But, that's so when true. When I look back now and I think about the guys' weddings I've been in and, and the group chats I got right now, man, 
I think, you know, just not having things back then kept us pure. It kept pure relationships. And, you know, I'm from South Carolina. I got buddies from Mississippi and I got buddies from Memphis putting me in the car and taking me home with them. And their families feed me and getting to know their families. And, you know, that's what it's all about. You know, when I look back at my college experience, yeah, I remember the games that I played and all of that stuff. But those are the things right there that are precious to me. And, and nowadays, man, you've got guys, even with the transfer portal, I man, I couldn't imagine not graduating college with the guys I started with. Like, yeah. they're my boys. Like, you go look at me and my wife's wedding picture, them guys I came in with, those are the guys that were my groomsmen, man. Those are the guys when I go to Memphis, Tennessee right now, I try to get on the phone and we all getting together. And that's the college experience. And now you've got guys leaving after they freshman in and they graduate. And they, I mean, you got guys going to three and four colleges. I couldn't That's imagine crazy. that, man. So, you know, I understand this is the world that they live in, but I have to be honest with you when I tell you, man, I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> it's funny because I can't really talk. I, I'm I'm one of the I'm one of the guys that's transferred. I actually did a year <laughs> at Radford before I graduated, or I did the, my next three years at Virginia Tech and ultimately graduated. So I was in that transfer portal at a, at a time as well. <laughs> it, it, except I never actually, you know, got to step on the field or anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> Uh, so no, I'm I'm curious though, gentlemen, because it, obviously you guys rolled into the offseason with a lot of momentum, and and Dwight and I were kind of talking about how it would have been easy for players to hang their heads to to sort of uh, you know mail it in when you started two and four last season, but that's the opposite of what happened. You guys rallied, you finished as strong really as you possibly could have. Now now that you're in the point where spring practice is going the spring game is is on its way and by the way Dwight I'm going to be in town for the spring game this year it's okay. going to be awesome I'm looking forward to it. it's been a few years since I've been able to be there but I'm curious as just to how spring practice is going and and coach P, coach P and 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 coach DJ like you know specific your your specific position groups like some things that are standing out to you and the preparation that goes into the spring game uh cuz obviously it's a it's a unique time of year especially for for college football you know, it's, 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 it's definitely the time. And, you know, uh, Dwight will tell you, man, we had some of our best battles, offenses versus defense in the spring, man. That's the yeah. thing, you yeah. know, because because you're not playing against anyone else except yourselves. So we made it mm -hmm. we made it fun. And, you know, and for coaches, man, it's our opportunity to get a really good eval on, you know, some players that may have not got to play as much last year. And some opportunities for your returning guys to work on skills and, weaknesses that they need to improve on from last year and coaches just to see how much they can handle. We put them under some situations and, you know, for us, fundamentals is, is our key. We want to make sure we work on the fundamentals in the spring. We may sprinkle in and try a couple of things to see if it works, but our fundamental, our base fundamentals is our key focus point in the spring. So it's some competition and it's some competitiveness and, 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 you know, uh, we find a way to make it fun and competitive because that's the center of our, uh, five standards is, is competition, but uh, it's fun, you know, and, and ultimately we want to get through that thing, develop some young guys, uh, improve the skill of some returning guys, and health is the premium. You know, yes. come out healthy. And that's the most important come out thing healthy. Spring is that we come out healthy so we can hit this thing. You know, all the potential in the world for the 2024 season needs us to come out healthy. You know, for me, I would say, you know, the one thing that's showing up, uh, probably more than anything else, is just the continuity. I mean, you're going into the third year now of running the same offense, running the same defense. Um, for the majority, you've got the same coaches uh, repeating the same things, and you've got a lot of the same players that have been on, on the roster that are now starting to echo uh, what we're saying and help us coach. And that's a program. You know, it's very difficult in year one to come in because you're trying to learn each other's personalities as a staff, and you're trying to see – how what you know and what you do fits your players. And, you know, we've got all that figured out right now. And as, as we said earlier, being able to keep our staff intact and being able to get the vast majority of our players, especially our upperclassmen um, on our roster, has been huge. You know, and uh, when you talk about my position in particular, well, my and MP's position because we're DB coaches, I think probably the most glaring thing for us is just the competition um, that we – get to go against every day um, in practice. You know, we, we've got a really good receiving core. Uh, we've got a very seasoned, comfortable quarterback right, right now. And those guys go at each other. You know, we grade everything. 
um, at Virginia Tech. Um, all periods, um, we watch every single play that's run at practice uh, every day, um, have our input on it, and then we try to go as watch as much as that as we can with our players. And, you know, day in, day out, these guys are battling. Uh, these guys are trying to win, and, you know, they get the best of us some days. Some days we get the best of them. And that's when, as a coach, you feel good because, you know, it's, there's a balance. Uh, you know, we've got NFL caliber guys on offense. We've got NFL caliber guys on defense. And I always say this, man, uh, it's been my philosophy for a long time. When you watch the captains on Saturday walk out um, to the middle of the field, um, it's usually four of them. But those are the guys that your players and your coaches have voted are your best players and your best leaders, right? When you watch yes. them walk out and when those captains get to the point to where their NFL draft picks, that's when you know you've got your program to the point to where you're ready to compete. When you walk captains out there and they're good guys, they're good students, but they're not draft picks, your program's probably not to the point to where you needed to get to. And I think we're getting to the point now where a lot of our leadership on our football team um, are draft picks, um, they're NFL caliber players. And, and let's be honest, you have to have those players in this league to compete at the top because the best teams in this league, that's what they're going to look like when they walk their captains out on Saturday. No question. Um, just a few more questions, Coach, but I definitely want to ask you both this. And uh, Coach DJ, I'll stick with you first on this one. I touched on earlier jokingly, but, you know, congratulations to your colleague and your coach, Coach Marv. Um, I feel like last year as a coach, he became more well-known to the fan base because we have a passionate and outspoken fan base. I know y'all hear about it. I know y'all not in there, but Twitter spaces after losses and wins. A lot of times I'm riding for y'all. So I know I can't get any kickback, but I'm in them Twitter spaces riding hard <laughs> Trying to tell one time after we lost to ODU uh, a couple of years ago, me and Lauren Johnson, it was 400 people in there. We, Lauren Johnson, and I kept everybody on board, man. And now everybody came back and said, y'all were right. But I want to, I want to ask you on a serious note though about Coach Marv, because I feel like he, Virginia Tech, and 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 you both know this, you know, we've always, even with the Tyrods and my cousins and the Ryan Williams and the Sharones, we've always had great players on offense, but we're a defensive school with the lunch pail. I tell people all the time, me and Andre Davis talk about this. In my five years at Tech, I never touched a lunch pail. I've never touched a lunch pail. Wow. I got a fake one in my basement down here, but I've never touched So Marv walked into a situation where Prob was there when it started, okay? And he knows he was there with me and Pearson. I remember seeing Coach Prob, and I know him. I knew him back then. And you have Bud Foster, who's an icon. Now you got Coach Marv. And you guys took some some huge step forwards this past season. How was he like as a coach? And what are you learning from him? And like, I, I mean, we talk about all the great things he's doing with recruiting, but how is he? I mean, what kind of coach is he? What are you what are you guys learning? You know, the thing I would say about Coach Marr um is very simple. He has the it factor. You know, I've been doing this for 25 years, and you know um when you're coaching with someone. Um, when you've been around someone, that they just have that special uh, charisma, leadership, character, and everything that goes into being successful. You know, he's a very, very smart guy. He's a football guy. And um, I had actually had a chance to get to know Coach Marv several years before we started working together. He and I were actually in a coaching seminar together several years ago. And he was like 25, 26 years old at that time. And you just knew he had it, you know, just by they asked us questions. They had us all sitting around uh, prominent athletic directors. And, you know, he just looked like he fit. Uh, being an older guy, you know, you notice things like that. So I've also known some people that have been fortunate enough to work with him on other staffs that he's been with. And when you get a guy that everybody that he works with or works around says the same things about him, you know, you've got a guy. And the unique thing about Marv is, you know, Coach Pride brought him in, a uh, former player of his. Um, he's the youngest guy in the room. Um, he's yeah. the least experienced guy in the room, you know, <laughs> when he comes in there. So you've got to have a personality about yourself because you know Pearson. You've gotten to know me. Y'all know yep. J.C. Price. That's yes. a lot of personalities in that room. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, that's know. what I'm saying. 
when, when, when you talk about walking and talk to our defensive staff room, you've got a lot of accomplished guys um, in a lot of different areas. Uh, you've got a lot of guys with a lot of years behind them, either playing at the highest level or coaching at the highest level. And Marv came in and, you know, who he is didn't change. You know, he, he didn't worry about trying to prove anything to us. Um, and, and I think probably the most um, important thing I'll say that nobody gets to see, man, is we care about each other. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I made a post a couple of days on Twitter about real men um, support each other. They don't talk about, they're not jealous of, they're not envious of, they don't hate on, uh, they support each other. And that's the one thing I would say about that defensive staff room is we support one another. We spend a lot of time in there together. You know, certain times of the year, we with each other a lot more than we with our families. You know, I'm around yes. Pilo a lot more than I'm with my wife. That's why you, yeah. you always see us smiling, man. I'm always with this guy. You know, yeah, I'm man. Guys, but you know, Mar hey, does hey, 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 shout out to your wife, man. I thought we we're friends on Facebook. When y'all go out, y'all go out, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> styling. She, they I look think great. She, I think she plans all week what she's gonna dress me up in so we can take those pictures. So I can't take a lot of credit <laughs> for that. But man, Coach Marv just does a really good job of making sure that everybody in the room has a chance to be a teammate. And he's not one of those guys trying to do it all himself. You know, if you came to our meetings, I think you would be probably more impressed with how he runs the meetings and how he delegates things and how he asks for suggestions. And then you see the finished product. We never, ever get into a situation to where it's a dictatorship or it's one-sided. You know, regardless of whose idea it is, Marv is going to say, what you think, what you think, what you think. And sometimes it's three to five. I mean, sometimes it's three to two. Sometimes it's all balanced, but we're going to go with the majority. But very rarely do you hear him say, this is my way and this is how we're going to do it. And mm -hmm. I think the balance of honestly having a bunch of guys in the room that support him, we're behind him. Uh, we want to see him successful because his success is our success. And I think Coach Pride being at the top, um, has stepped away and has let Marv do things the way he wants to do. And I think you're starting to see the fruits of our labor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's well said. Um, uh, Danny, did you have another question? Well, I was just, I, I was kind of curious, you know, listening, listening to you coach Chita talk about sort of the dynamic in, in the, in the coaches meetings and, and some of the stuff that you guys are working in on a daily basis. I, I, I'm just kind of curious if there's been like a learning moment that you look back on where either it was something that you guys experienced in season, in practice and film, something that, that, that seemed like a, a moment of clarity where, where something just sort of like clicked for you guys either as a staff or or you know as as you're trying to figure out how to best set these guys up for success best set the team up for success have have, have there been any moments and, and that could be a plural answer as well that have stood out as as to where you guys have really felt like you know you 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 learned something or um you know found a new way to do something i think the biggest thing for um all of us and uh, i'll let p piggyback off of this when i'm done I think as a staff, when you figure out what you can do with the talent level you have, as opposed yeah. to what you know as a coach, and that's always the happy medium. You know, we all have philosophies of what we like to do. Uh, we've all done things. We can all get on a board and draw up what we do. We can all show you a playbook. But none of that means anything if it doesn't fit with the talent level that you have and the experience that you have. And I think probably the biggest moment of clarity for us was last year, you know, me in particular, and I'll talk about my room, having a healthy Dorian Strong, uh, having a Mansoor Delane that I just didn't throw out there mid-season as a freshman. I mean, most people don't mm -hmm. realize I never coached Mansoor Delane until we played North Carolina because he had a broken collarbone. And the kid's playing mm -hmm. cornerback. He's a true freshman. So I'm trying to coach him throughout the season. He never had spring. He never had a training camp. Um, so he played on ability and he played on, you know, instinct or whatever. But having him for that spring, having Dorian and then me being able to look at Coach Marv and Coach Pry and say, hey, we can play man coverage, you know, because now if I can tell them we can play man coverage, that changes everything we're doing. And that changes what Marv calls. 
and that changes the schematics of our whole um, program as far as what we're doing defensively. I, I, I agree with it, but I am going to piggyback, man. You know, uh, I always tell the story <clears throat> when I was done playing football, man, and I, I went right into high school football as a D coordinator, and you couldn't tell me that I wasn't going to be the best D coordinator in the nation on the high school <laughs> level. And, you know, just just the knowledge that I got from the game, playing it so many years and, and being in the Greg Williams system that did so many things well, and I'm probably set the record for the most yards given up you know, uh, uh, in a single season. And I was giving up about five to 600 yards a season. And, 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 a, and a lot of it had to do with B. Some of it had to do with uh, with the talent that we had on the field that year. But through time, I was able to, to, to understand the talent that we had and what they could retain. And as I kept it simple, it kind of met together. And I think that's what we're doing here, like Coach DJ is saying. You know, it took a year for us to figure out what are our guys good at and how much can they actually retain? And as we tailor Coach Marv's and Coach Pride's defense to fit the guys in the room, we're also getting the right guys in the room to tailor what we want to do. And, and I think midway through last year, we, we, we met that goal and, and we're getting better at it now. We're recruiting the kind of guys that we need to do what we want to do. And we're learning just how much of it we need to do and simplifying it on both ends. And that's kind of what makes the team great. It's not how much we know or how good they are. It's how good they are at what we can give them and how much can they handle so when we get out there on Saturday, we can play fast, have fun, and fly around. That's what defense is all about. No doubt. That's well said, too. And y'all got some dogs and some dogs coming. Y'all got two of my guys. I mean, y'all getting them Holland Spring guys. I got my man, uh, Caleb Woodson. Uh, he was a cyborg up here at Battlefield. That's my dude. Great family. <laughs> got a younger brother, too, that's a dog up here in the 703. Um, but, you know, I'll end it with this question for you, Pearson, and, and also you, Coach DJ, and then we can let you guys go. I know you got work to do, family time. But, uh, Pearson, I'll start with you, and then DJ, like I said, you answer. One thing I noticed um, back, you know, I hate saying back in my day, but when we played, the culture was in place, the expectations, and it was almost like we're not going to mess this up. So it was like conference championship. Back then it was the Alliance Bowl, then BCS Bowl, but that was the standard conference championship. Um, and we knew how to, it was almost like the coaches didn't let us get too big headed and we knew how to handle success. And I said this on the, I tweeted this a few times. I said this on the radio show I do. Actually, I do it tomorrow morning, Big Dog Sports Radio. I said this all the time. And I said this last year, I felt like Virginia Tech, once you guys got over the hump, you had some tough losses in Pearson. You came out, we talked, and you said, hope people understand that we are so close to getting this thing right. And then all of a sudden, everything started to happen offensively, defensively, special teams, tooting, or kick returns, everything. But the one thing for me that I started to see that is one of those things that you can't measure with a magazine or, or a blog or a tweet is that it seemed like Coach Cheetah and Pearson, your players started to learn how to handle success and they started to learn how to win and they started to embrace taking ownership. I felt like in previous seasons, even before y'all got there, or Pearson, when you came back, that they would have a big win and then two tough losses. And I felt that wasn't so much execution. It was more so learning how to win, but more importantly, learning how to handle success. Right now, Virginia Tech, you got drones, publications now, even now in March, are saying he's a Heisman candidate. Everybody's talking about pride. Virginia Tech is, is, is a dark horse with some, and some people saying a, a ACC championship contender. Everybody's coming back on offense, defense. All these young guys grew up, got some guys that got some reps. There's all this buzz and momentum. How do y'all keep them grounded? Because both of you guys know this as coaches and former players. The handling success is 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 – is is a big thing. I take a lot of shots at Miami because Miami was our rival. They have yet to learn how to handle success. Y'all don't need to say nothing. That's me. I'm saying that. They have <laughs> not, you know, all that talent. So you guys have a lot of expectations this year as coaches for your own self, but also the media, which what me and Danny do. So Pearson, how do you keep them grounded? And do you understand kind of what I'm getting at about winning and learning how to handle success? Uh, absolutely. Now, we, we all understand that prosperity can be your, big, your biggest enemy. You know, uh, I think one of the things that we haven't touched on tonight that I think 
is changing our culture the most is our effect on these guys as individuals. And I think that when we talk about the ground up and our foundation, you know, when we talk about mentality, you know, we, we're talking about getting the right players that can cover, the right guys that can run, and the defense and the scheme. But Coach Chito will tell you, man, we're changing these guys' minds and, and how they think in their lives and off the field. And when you can touch these guys and who in the minute they become off the field and how they carry themselves each and every day and how they think and how they handle adversity on and off the field, those things will carry on over to the field. They'll be able to handle the small setbacks and, and they'll be able to take the prosperity and the success and understand that the reason why they are successful is because of those ground foundation, those base fundamental things that we've done. And it ain't just a fly by night because anybody can get rowdy enough and the ball can bounce the right way and you can get a couple of good breaks. And with a good to average team, you can go out and get a big win against a good team. And I think in the past we've had some of that. But when you're putting in the groundwork on and off the field and developing these guys mentally as men where they can handle everything, we're understanding totally how much time and work and effort it is to put in to being successful. And when you have your setback, you know, hey, we just got to work a little harder. We're right where we need to be. And when you have your prosperity, you go right back and work a little harder because you know those are the things that got you where you are. So we're, we're spending a lot of time diving into these guys as men off the field and I think some of that is showing up on the field and making us better players because we're becoming better people. And Coach Cheeto will tell you more about how we're doing that. I love it. You know, you said a key word, um, Dwight. Uh, you, you talked about culture, you know, when you was asking this question. And, you know, the thing that we didn't have to worry about back during our era was the Internet. You know, we didn't have to worry about recruiting services. We didn't have to worry about recruiting rankings. I mean, you think back then, you know, you could hope to maybe get your name in a newspaper and possibly a magazine, maybe on the news if you did something, but how are you going to go read about yourself? How are you really going to grow an ego? You know, and nowadays, man, these kids kind of come in immortalized before they ever step foot on campus. And now you've added NIL um, and things to it. So you have to create unity. And that hasn't changed from the time we went to school. You still have to unify. And I think probably one of the things that helped us most now that I look back at it were those losses. Because when we were going through those losses, in particular this past season, our team really, really unified because it was kind of us against the world. You know, our players were reading what the fans were saying about them. <laughs> you know, mm. they don't stay off the internet. And, and as coach, we're having to, as Coach P said, we're having to be walking examples for them of how to come to work every day with your head up and how to keep believing. And, and we're teaching that. And that makes people buy into you as a leader. That makes younger players buy into older players. And I think that was needed because we were still trying to develop the defensive chemistry and the offensive chemistry. I think when you look at a lot of the things that happened, you know, drones didn't start out the year as our quarterback. Therefore, our offense was geared to a guy that had a completely different skill set than his. It takes time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a football guy. He's a football guy. Marv's a football guy. Prize a football guy. But the vast majority of our fans don't see it like that. They just want to see you win. But people must understand, we're not trying to win a game. We're trying to establish a winning program. And when yes. you're doing that, there's a lot of things that you have to teach these young men as people, as men, you have a lot of young men coming in with egos now. You have a lot of young men you have to humble, you know, because of the landscape that they come through and the things that are going on. And a lot of that was going on despite what you were seeing on the scoreboard. We saw the growth. And I can remember Coach. We lose him. We're right there. I know you're tired of saying that, but we're right there. We lost him again. Way form of fashion show disbelief. You know, you talk about be mad on Twitter. I go on Twitter and they're attacking me. I guarantee you one thing, you wake up every morning, you're going to see them four tweets up. I'm not going to hide my face, <laughs> you know, because I believe I've been doing this 25 years. I played the game. Why would I let somebody on the internet cause me to hide my face? But when I don't hide my face, guess what my players don't do? They don't hide their face. 
And no. that's part of building a program, being a walking example of young men of how to deal with adversity. Now, people don't understand what that has to do with man coverage or what that has to do with running a takeoff or running an outside zone. All of that stuff comes with maturity. All of that stuff comes with helping habits. And that's what we were doing. And I think when it clicked, so to speak, a lot of different things happened, but probably nothing was more valuable than just seeing the leadership on our team really, really blossom. And I'm not talking about us as coaches, seeing the guys on our team put their arms around people and say, we're going to be okay, despite what everything is saying. We lose another game. We're going to be okay. And then when we did start to win a little bit, you didn't see them act no differently because guess what? We believed all along. The results were just coming and we're just getting started, man. I love it. No, and I, um, I'm i more than likely going to be at the spring game. I come every year. There was a few years I didn't come, but, you know, here you both know having kids and <laughs> things like that. But um, I'm, a, I'm I'm thankful that you both were on, man. I'm, I'm, I'm loving what you're doing for my alma mater. I tell people all the time, you know, um, when Pearson played for Washington, I cheered for him. I, I grew up a Washington Redskins, now a Commanders fan, but I support the local teams in the D.C. area from a distance. I don't have a favorite team except for Tech. So when y'all lost that tough with the NC State or we lose to Louisville, it takes me a several hours during the day to get my mind right because I'm sitting here. <laughs> I, I stay off Twitter, too, and I get on. I said, oh, let me respond to this tweet. And my wife was like, why would you respond? I said, because they don't know what they're talking about, man. And then next thing you know, I'm riding for the program, but Tech is my favorite program, my favorite school, and you two are two of my favorite coaches. Um, you know, DJ, we met a few years ago, so I'm glad you're a Hokie and you're doing great things for the program. When I hear you talk, man, I see you tweet, I can tell you care. And I, I know a lot of players in your program, young guys, and they talk highly of both of you guys. Pearson, my brother, uh, I can't talk about all the crazy nights we had in the summers of Blacksburg. <laughs> I'm not even going to talk about heard, it, man. I've but... heard about some of that. Listen, I bro, I'm so glad we didn't have this as coach uh, DJ Ooh. talked mm. about. God, thank you. Um, but no, keep mm -hmm. doing the great work, man. Keep doing um, the mentoring and leadership. I I'm glad Pearson touched on that because, you know, I look at the uh, coaching tree from Tech. It's amazing. But I take a step back and look further. All the guys doing great stuff, whether in coaching like Anthony Midget and Lauren Johnson, and you got Lawrence Lewis doing health and fitness and Sharon's an educator. Derek Smith is a principal. I can go on and on with guys from the 80s and 90s and 2000s. So many guys are doing great things because of what you both talked about, the the, the adversity and overcoming it. You know, because I didn't realize we were running hills and stadium steps and bar hangs that was going to help me be a great father, but it did. It does. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, man, thank you guys. I know you guys are busy. Thank you both, man. When I get in the burg, I'll touch base with both of y'all, man. Thank y'all. Continue the great work with the spring game and the recruiting and all of that, man. Hokie Nation appreciate you. Danny and I appreciate you both. Yeah, yeah thank you guys. Appreciate you guys having us on, man. Thank you, man. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, Danny. Yep. I'll see you, boy. Appreciate all you guys. Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good night. Night. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, that is uh, Coach uh, – DJ and Coach uh, Pearson Prelo, um joining us, man, on the um, Victory Life Legacy podcast. We uh, are thrilled to have them on, um, and they were both great, um, great guests and dropped a lot of nuggets and a lot of gems. Um, you know, Danny, before we sign off and do our legacy shout outs, um, I just want to, you know, it's funny, man, I've known Pearson, I've known Pearson since what, gosh, 1995. 95 is when he wow. came in. He, 95, man. Think about that. It's 2024. And they still wow. my brother, man. Um, he makes me proud, man. When I see him, I see his son plays at tech and um he's got a great family. And it's just it's just great to see. And and sometimes as much as you and I love sports, we forget that, you know, it's a game and guys want to get their degrees and go to the league, but you know, they also helping young men, young men prepare for the future. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, they were both great, man. I'm glad we were able to get them on. We've been trying here and there, but our schedules couldn't work. And Coach DJ, you can tell. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm going to say this, man. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm pretty good at picking things like that. Hearing D Both of them talk mm -hmm. very well. I wouldn't be surprised if Coach DJ oh, yeah. becomes the head coach for a few years. Um, I, I'm not, oh, I didn't yeah. want to ask him that. 
he just has that feel like you want to follow him. It's Miss Pearson. But DJ, you know, yes, his, his quotes on Twitter and all his different things he says is, is, is mm -hmm. you know, I call him versus, but he's always spitting great facts, man. But, um, yeah, so isn't, it, isn't it funny that he, well, isn't it funny that he talked about how Coach Marv has that it factor? But, and, and I agree with him on that, but it's funny because I think Coach Cheetah also has that it factor. You know what I mean? He, does. he just, he's, he, there, there's something, there's something about him. When he talks, you listen. You know, he's, he just has that aura about him. And Tech, I think, is so lucky to have both of those guys. Tech is, is so lucky to have both Coach Prelo and, and Coach Cheetah. You know, they're both great individuals and, and also great coaches who are, very clearly open to to learning and to to connecting with the players you know it's it's not just about winning games and training and that sort of thing it's it's about the human element of it too and i'm i'm so glad that pearson brought that up because i feel so fortunate and and i never took it for granted to know pearson and to have known pearson i've known him now for 8 years that that was the first time that we did our our pregame show together and i i again i never took those those times for granted to, to sit there and listen to him. I, I, there was, there, it was, it was, it was such a treat to be able to ask him about like, you know, what was it like playing with Sean Taylor? You know, what was it, I know. what was it like being a part of, what was it like being a part of, of those or in the same question that I would have, that I've asked you many times, what was it a part being here at Virginia tech in the early days when, when things were just getting off the ground, when you knew you had something but it wasn't quite there yet, but you were still having a lot of success and it just kept getting better and better. So it's, it's, it was really, it's really neat to hear everything that they've done and, and that they continue to, to work on. I'm, I'm really excited. I think the program has a bright future. Yeah. And you know, the thing about it is, it's funny, you know, you, you grew up a Washington skins fan, now yeah. commanders fan, like I did. And Greg Williams, who, because of that scandal with the whole uh uh gate, what's it called? The uh, bounty, bounty bounty gate. I, I hate that because you forget what a great def defensive coordinator he was, like he was, and yeah. he was a mastermind at running schemes and blisses and exotic blisses. But what I remember, I probably said this story a few times to our listeners or other platforms I've been on, but Pearson Prelo was such a great defensive mind in Washington. That when Greg mm. Williams left and went to New Orleans, he took Pearson with him. He took him. And mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. watching a game one time. I was home one Sunday afternoon, and the announcer was talking about Pearson. I, by then, he was getting up there in age. He was still a still a contributor and playing in the rotation. But they talked about what Greg Williams thought about Pearson, and 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 that will go to my final point about our show today. Is that um, Fry gets it because I know it's only been two years going into his third year, but. As Coach uh, DJ, a.k.a. Coach Cheetah, mentioned, that staff they got, man, Marv, JC, and every man, listen. And they just added Cam Phillips, you know? That's right, I, that, as of this week. Cam mm -hmm. Phillips, I mean, that, that is – That was cool. I think that's – I'm not even trying to bring his name up, but I kept trying to say you got to get guys in that program that can relate a message to this new generation of what it means to be a Hokie. Not football mm -hmm. player. Not 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 conference champion, a hokey. And what I mean is when I'm at the Metro, I live in your old stomping grounds in the DMV in DC, Northern Virginia. When yeah. I'm in Northern Virginia, I could be on 66. I've had people honk the horn and go, hokies. We're not I mean <laughs> it's just something special about it, bro. Like it is what it is. No different from what I'm sure Michigan fans feel or whatever, but it is a unique thing to be a hokey. But Danny, this has been a lot of fun. Before I do our legacy uh shout outs. Who you got in the final four? I didn't do a bracket. I haven't done a bracket in like Ooh. four years. Do you get? Ooh. I don't do brackets anymore. I just pick before the game. I, my pick. You really don't do all. a bracket? Nah, man. I always forget and do whatever. I, my son and my wife do it, so I just live vicariously to them and I argue with them. Like, why'd you pick them? And so my son <laughs> has got Arizona <laughs> winning it. He's mad at oh. me because I told him to stay away from Kentucky. I said, dude, Kentucky Ooh. will let you down. I have UConn winning it, but do you have a? I don't have yeah. anybody else. I don't know. It's weird this year, man. It, it, it'll yeah. probably be some team. UConn should win it, but who knows? Yeah. Do you have a final? Well, so score? let me. Yeah, let let me give you a quick rundown here, real quick. First of all, I was the only person in my work bracket, my work pool last year, to pick UConn. 
So I was on the Huskies before anybody else was. And I picked them and I put 10 bucks on them to win the championship before the tournament start last last year. And I won 100, 110 bucks, something like that. So was sitting pretty with that. And then, by the way, a week after that went final, I also picked John Rahm to win the Masters. So that was like the two, the best two week stretch of my wow. of my uh, my handicapping life. Yes. So this year I went right back to the well. And I went right back to UConn. And and it's not because I was feeling lucky or anything like that. I think UConn is head and shoulders the best team in the country this year. I don't it's 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 amazing that Purdue looked so good in the second round this past weekend. And then UConn played an hour or so after them and looked even better. Because yeah. Purdue obviously everything revolves around Edie, the big man that they've got there in the middle. I mean, everything goes through ed yukon's big man's better i'm here to tell you right now that guy that they got down low yukon's big man is better he can he's more athletic he's he's less timid he's faster he's he's just as big they have they have everything so if they don't go back to back i think it will be a tremendous disappointment but we're allowed to have three so i have like a prime bracket i've got a chalk bracket and i've got a uh, wild card bracket. So my prime bracket, the main one, I got UConn winning it all. In my chalk bracket, I have all four one seeds in the final four, but I have UNC winning it all. And then my wild card bracket, I've got Iowa State winning it all. Because I like Iowa State. I like the way Iowa State looked in the Big 12 tournament. I'm always, you know, every, everyone likes the hot teams coming out of the conference tournaments. I, I think that's a great strategy to go with. So I still think UConn's got it in the bag, though. You know, if they show up and play like they're capable of, no one will come within 15 points of them. Yeah, no, I, I you got you like my my friend Aaron. He got all they got like 800 brackets, bro. You got all these. <laughs> you sound like you in Vegas or MGM up here where I'm at. Um, I, I saw <laughs> UConn midseason. I've seen UConn. They got a kid up here from my neck of the woods, a Ross kid. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. he's from uh, Northern Virginia. His dad actually, I'm cool with his dad. His, his youngest brother is at Patriot. He's gonna be good too. Um, oh. His, his dad is Julian Ross, who played at Rutgers when I was at Tech. He's a few years younger than me. Played against Mike when Mike was uh, tearing the Big East up and the rest of the nation. But um, yeah, I like yeah. UConn. I, I mean, anybody can win it. That's why this is crazy. Foul trouble, sketchy officiating. Um, yes. I think it's clear in the women's game, but in the men's game, anything can happen. I mean, you know, in the Sweet 16, this might be one of the better Sweet 16s we're going to see with Duke and Houston and UNC and all different teams. NC State's on like a oh, yeah. crazy familiar run, very similar to when Jimmy Valvano was there, man. You, right? Four, yeah. four, four ACC teams. They keep yeah. trying to knock us, Dwight, and all the ACC does is achieve when it when it comes down to crunch time. They keep trying not to knock us. I ain't gonna lie. You you have been more of a believer. I did not. See, I didn't even know Clemson made the tournament, bro. I thought that was an <laughs> NIT game. I said, what is Clemson doing? My son was like, That's well, UVA crazy. didn't belong. No, UVA they did not belong to the tournament. They, they did not deserve they... a bid. Straight up. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, they didn't. I mean, this none. It's not. I mean, Pitt, I mean, Pitt, Pitt would have been a better pick than UVA to go in. I think I there think was a that, lot of brand identity going and, into the and, decision and, to let the Cavaliers in. And I will in. say this. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say this. That happens. And I'm not arguing with you. Mm -hmm. It happens because one year Virginia Tech, after losing to Carolina in the ACC tournament in the semifinals when they had, um, my God, I am getting old in name. What's the, the white kid that was really good, All-American? Uh, he got his nose broke against Duke. Oh, Hansborough, uh, Tyler Hansborough. Hansborough, yeah. they played Tech, and Tech led the entire game, and then he went crazy the last couple of minutes. We lost for like one or two points. Yeah. And, I remember um, that. They were interviewing um, you know, the coach. And he was just talking about not not Carolina's coach, but a Virginia Tech. And Seth. he's Seth. Must have been he Seth. was like, yeah. he said, You would be certifiedly insane if you don't pick us. And Tech should have made it. And mm -hmm. I think those two yeah. years they didn't make it, I think it was because Virginia Tech basketball brand was wasn't what it should have been. I don't think mm -hmm. it was about quad one wins and quad. I don't think Virginia Tech was viewed the way it's viewed now. Where if Tech had a few more quad one or better showings, I think they would have got in this year. Because Virginia Tech, Probably. credit to Buzz and Mike Young, the basketball program mm -hmm. has credibility. Like the women's, that's why you talk about uh, Kenny Brooks, man. I mean, the the reality is he's leaving Virginia Tech women's basketball in a great place. I mean, 
yeah. you get the right guy, just build on what he did. He recruited well. Yeah. Um, you got great players that stayed. So anyway, Danny, it was great to reconnect with you. It's been a long time since we chopped it up in our legacy podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been swamped, like I said, driving around the DMV, putting miles in my car, saving the world, working with at-risk youth like I do. And, you know, I'm getting older, so I got to uh, go to the rest area and uh, recharge. <laughs> but um, <laughs> just to wrap up, man, Legacy Spotlight, Legacy Spotlight shout outs. You know, we always want to keep it local, keep it hokey. Um, you know, for those listening, if you're new to our show, watch and listen on Spotify or SoundCloud, we shout out. Um, Anybody that's been through our school doesn't have to be an athlete. It could be anybody that we feel like deserves some type of flowers or recognition, man. I'm going to keep it real simple on this one. I'm a little rusty with these, but this is something I think I remember talking to Pearson, thinking about this and thinking about uh, Keekly and some of the women's players and some of the kids hitting the portal, you know, hearing Coach DJ talk mm -hmm. about when he graduated and having guys you play with in your wedding. I'm going to shout out all the seniors getting ready to walk that stage in Blacksburg because mm. whether you go and you're a grad transfer, but when you graduate from college, you know, you talk about your time, you're younger than me. You talk about like where I'm at in my life, getting ready to see my son graduate in May. My daughter's at ODU getting ready to be a junior. And then my youngest is wow. getting ready to be a freshman. Right. You see, wow. Right. I'm, I'm, my son yeah. is getting ready to graduate from high school, May 28th. And to That's know crazy. that I'm going to have two in college is insane. And I got one left. Mm -hmm. And I think about my time <laughs> in Blacksburg. Like, it really goes fast. Like, I met Pearson in 1995. Um, and him, Keon Carpenter, God rest his soul, Lauren Johnson, uh, they all came in. Derek Smith, my roommate, one of my best friends, we all came in. We read sure that they didn't. But that was 1995. It's 2024. Yeah. I got grades now. Um, you know what I'm saying? I got the thin joint. I got the Charlie Brown going on up top. That's why I rock the fittings. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm still big sexy, but at the same time, of I'm course. serious. I want to shout out all the seniors out there, man, that's graduating, that's getting ready to walk, whether it's in Lane Stadium or in your, your major department, um, what you're majoring in, man, because, you know, that's a major accomplishment. And, you know, these kids now have been through a lot more than when you and I were growing up with COVID. You know, um, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of crazy stuff, man. Bridges are yeah. collapsing, getting mm -hmm. hit by boats. Oh. You know, you got mm -hmm. stuff going on, mm -hmm. you know, holy wars and all of that. I mean, there's always a, a generational yep. challenge. But, you know, again, to the yep. athletes, non-athletes, congratulations. You know, the real world is no joke. I tell people, take your time growing up. It's a trap. Um, That's... But... <laughs> but... um. Congratulations to all the seniors, athletes, non-athletes, man, on, on a great run, a great time. Hopefully you enjoy the next phase of your life, man, because we're in March, getting ready to go into April. But most people, if they didn't graduate in December, are graduating in May. So um, those are, that's my legacy shout out, man. I just appreciate all the yeah. seniors that are getting ready to uh, to graduate. Well, I love that. And I know that's some wisdom you've imparted upon me at, at, at some point in the past about not growing up too fast, not rushing anything. And mm -hmm. it's something that, that I've always found to be very valuable. And and just to share some other advice that I've received over the years now, because I turned 30 last year. I'm going to be 31 oh. this year. I, I met you when I was in college. You know, I was just I think I was probably 19 or 20 when I met you. Oh. Um, so I've, I've known you a long time now, too, buddy. And yeah, my hair's man. starting to get gray. You can't see it right now, but I've got some grays up here. My hair's oh. thinning a little bit up here now, too, bro. You can't see it. That's the 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 magic of podcasts. And if you're if yes. you're watching us on YouTube right now, the picture is such that I I won't allow you to see that. So <laughs> we're we're gonna we're just gonna we're gonna make sure that it always stays that way, right? But I I, I think back to my senior year of football and the coaches, especially when we started to get into the season, talked about how okay. This is it's week one. You've got 10 of these left. That's all that's guaranteed to you. Nothing else is guaranteed after this. Go out and play like it's your last. And then you go through the season, get to week 10. This is the last one, right? You're guaranteed nothing after this. Now, we went on to play in the playoffs, and we, we lost in the Northern Region Championship that year to a very good Lake Braddock team. But I never took that advice for granted. Every week, I knew that 
there was one fewer week that we would all get to play on that field together. And then fast forward to when I was in college, actually it was right after I graduated college, our buddy, Bill Roth, voice of the Hokies, a legend in every sense of the word. It was after I graduated because he told me, and I think it was about a year after I graduated, which was in 2015. We're coming up on 10 years since I left college. And he said, the years only go by faster the longer that you've been out of college. And every year, I find that to be more and more true because the years just keep going by faster and faster. So to Dwight's point, anybody out there listening, any kids, any any anybody, don't, don't take anything for granted, right? And and if if I'm speaking to anybody older than me, then you already know that. But it's it's amazing how fast time passes. But I do have a very good legacy spotlight because you alluded to him earlier in the show, and I want to make sure that we show him some love it's Caleb Henson at 149 pounds, Virginia Tech's just second national champion wrestler. Caleb Henson repping the Hokies on the national stage, winning a national championship, doing something that's incredibly difficult. Caleb, they call him the Hitman Henson. Mm-hmm. Uh, just an incredible, an incredible run. And, and like you alluded to as well, head coach Tony Roby, awesome awesome representative of Virginia Tech. What an amazing job he's done with that wrestling program. All they've done is win ACC championships since he took over for Kevin Dresser. And and see, that was another moment where when Kevin Dresser left, a lot of folks thought, ah, well, what will Tech do now? Well, someone stepped up to to fill that void and, and then some, you know, because Kevin Dresser has not had the same success at, uh, at his new school that, that Tony Roby has had here. So, uh, Man, big, big shout outs and, and, and the legacy spotlight, Caleb Penson, national champion Hokie. Great shout out. And I kind of, I, I was wondering if you were going to shout him out because I, I I was like, you know what, let me keep it simple. But he is a great selection and mm. a national champion in wrestling. I can't, you know, man, wrestling is no joke, man. Like those guys were. That's a were brutal bad. sport. Yeah. But listen, that's a, you that's a ain't tough lying. sport. They were badasses. Then they're badasses now. <laughs> Those guys are great. <laughs> and Coach Tony Roby, shout out to my guy Roby. He was on the mm-hmm. pod a year ago, man. And he's got a victory life hoodie. That's my dude. I need to check in with him. I need to send him a text. Matter of fact, when we get off here, I'm going to send him a text. Yeah. But anyway, listen, great episode to our subscribers, our followers. If you're new, continue to share. We're going to get into a better rhythm. Like I said, been on a hiatus, but we're back. Special thanks again to Coach Pearson Prelo and Coach DJ a.k.a. Coach T- Cheetah, man, and the whole Virginia Tech coaching staff. I played with most of those guys. Um, if you get into the spring game, man, you see me and Danny show us some love, uh, travel safely, safe travels, drink responsibly. The spring game yes. is insane. Um, mm-hmm. You know, but anyway, like I say every episode, thank you to everybody. No matter what you do, no matter where you go, make sure you have a positive impact. You live a great legacy. That's Victory Life. Danny and I are out. See you guys later. Thank you.